Welcome back on this fine day and as some of you who have been watching my channel for a little while have come to realize I am something of a panoramic photographer. I love the panoramic view. I like anything that gives you that letterbox shape. I feel that the images tend to invite the viewer to scan from left to right and become basically absorbed by the scene in front of them. However, as easy as it is to do with modern day software and with the equipment that we now have, every now and again it goes wrong. Before we dive into how to create your manual panoramic stitch, please remember to pop a like and a subscribe once you've finished watching this video and you've enjoyed it, I hope. Your support goes a long way to promoting the channel and to allowing me to make more videos like this and other things. I have a couple of projects in the works at the moment, including a review of the Nisi Athena lenses, a quick tutorial on how I set up my Wacom tablet, a much longer video on how to shoot rolling stock and more besides. So remember to hit that subscribe button to keep this channel going and thank you so much for your support so far guys. Without further ado, let's dive back into manual stitching. So I have an example over here. These are photographs that I took on a recent workshop to Namibia and it is a handheld panoramic using a 70-200mm f2.8 lens. Everything was set up fine. In theory, you would think that the processing would be fairly easy. I'm in Capture One at the moment. I'm gonna click, grab those, then hit Merge, or sorry, Stitch to Panorama, and we're gonna let it do its thing. And you'd think it would work fine, especially with a long lens like that, except it doesn't. And I get Capture One was unable to create a Panorama Stitch preview. Please review your selection of photos and try again. Now I know these images should work fine. Even though they were handheld, there shouldn't be that much issue there. And it's the same if I try any of the other projections available. So let's try the next step, which would be in that case to select the images and say open with Photoshop. So I'm going to open up with a recent iteration of Photoshop. We're in 2024 and selecting the images again. So hitting command A, selecting all the images and then shift command M to stitch to a pano. Unable to automatically select a valid lens profile, which is interesting considering it was a Tamron lens, which means there should actually be EXIF data inside there. But I'll still say OK and I'll assume that it can merge it based on the material that's in the photograph and yet it won't let me do this. And it's the same if I go into Photoshop and I turn them into TIFF files. Okay, this is obviously going to become a problem. It doesn't necessarily work. So I'm going to have to do this manually. Back in the day, before we had all these automated processes to be able to stitch our images together, we had to do this manually. And I remember distinctly reading a practical photography article in I think it was somewhere around 2003 or 2004 on how to take your photographs into Photoshop back then it was Photoshop 6 I think and manually stitch them together so we're gonna have to resort back to that so for the photographers amongst you who have never done this before this is a quick step-by-step -step guide in how to manually stitch your photographs so that you don't have issues or that you can continue pre creating a panoramic image even when the software doesn't automatically allow you to. Since I am a Capture One fan, I'm going to start with working this in Capture One. Now, if you're going to be doing the automated process, I highly recommend you go into Shape and you make sure that you've got your distortion corrected and your light fall off is also at 100. We're wanting to correct for the issues that the lens has. And you can see from the metadata here that Yes, the software has picked up that I'm using a Tamron 7200 2.8 and it is automatically applying the lens corrections to this particular image. If I want to continue with the rest of my setup, I would go through for my ICC profile. I'm going to say Pro Standard and I'd prefer to have it in Film Standard over there as well. And I'm now going to take all of that and I'm going to apply it to the other images inside this grouping. So I've collected, I've selected the Copy Apply. I'm going to select all of my images and I'm just going to paste those adjustments through. So all three are identical. I'm now going to say edit with Photoshop 2024. So we're going to edit it in Photoshop and I'm going to make sure that we are working on a nice big file. So I've got Adobe RGB 1998 and we're working in a full fixed 100% view of the image. This is going to convert the raw image into a full bitmap image which can be edited in Photoshop, which is a bitmap editor. Once the images have come through into Photoshop, you will see that they are actually separate image files. Now, if you'd done this through Lightroom or through Bridge, you could have actually said, 
open images as a stack in Photoshop. We don't have that initi initially, so what I'm going to have to do is stack them, and that's fairly easy. All I'm going to do is go through to File, Scripts, and say Load Files into Stack. I'll add my open files and press OK, and it's automatically going to stack the images into a row of three images. The next step is to change my canvas size into something that would probably fit more likely to the image itself. So I'm gonna create a new layer, and I'm gonna place it down at the bottom of the image stack, and I'm going to change the actual canvas size based on that layer. To change your canvas size, you're gonna hit Option, Command, C, and I'm then going to change this to percent, and we're going to change the width to around 200%, maybe 250. Let's just make sure we've got enough space over here. And my height to just 120, just so I've got some playroom inside there. And you will see that there is my canvas now. My individual layers, I'm going to be able to move independently of the canvas itself. So this is my left-hand image. So I'll just take my V tool, or my move tool, shortcut key V, and push this across to the left-hand side. The bottom image over here is my right-hand image, so I'm going to just slide that across. And you can see already from this that theoretically this should really have been able to match these files. So I'm not quite sure why it didn't. It's a little bit odd, probably because there seems to be a little bit of lack of contrast in the image itself. So I'm just going to do a very general placement of these files and push them in a little bit. There we go, until I think that it's working fairly nicely. And even just like this, you can see that already my file should have actually worked. I'm not entirely sure why it didn't. I'm going to place my left and right images on the top of my middle file, and you'll see why in a moment. And just to make sure that this is all fairly easy to understand, I'm going to rename my actual layers. So I've got my middle image, my left image, and my right image, and this is purely to make it easier for us to work our way around the images themselves. Now we're going to zoom in, and what I'd like to do is take my left image and change its opacity ever so slightly, so that we can match it more accurately. I'll then use my move tool and I will move the file around until I can see as much of a matching as possible between the actual angles themselves. However, you'll notice it's never perfect, and this is because of parallax, the basic issue that as we move our lens, there's going to be some changes in the relative positioning of elements inside the frame itself. But we're going to get rid of that in the same way that the automated process does that, and that's by warping the image. So once I have my image more or less correctly aligned with the photograph itself, or the, the left-hand image with, the, with the, the image on the, in the middle, I'm now going to hit transform. So that's command T on a Mac. You can also access the transform button by going into edit, free transform. And then it'll give you a blue line around your file itself. By right clicking on the image, you can select warp. Now what warp does is it means that you can push and pull various sections of the image independently of the rest. So we're wanting to line up these dunes ever so slightly. So in this quadrant here, I'll just pull down a little bit until I feel it matches. And you just got a little fiddle a little bit until it all just seems to line up nicely over here. Remember this image here on the right, you are ignoring. So in some ways you could actually just switch that off. Whoopsie, I want the, that one switched off, I want that one switched off. And let's go back to our left image and we'll continue to warp it. So Command T and warp. Remember, we're wanting all of this just to line up as neatly as possible. It doesn't have to be perfect. There might be some errors. That's not a problem because once we've got this all lined up nicely, we're then going to do away with those errors themselves. You press enter when you are satisfied and you'll see that we're almost right, but there is a little bit of a shadow that you can see just on the edge here. We're going to get rid of that simply by zooming out a little bit now, and we're going to open up our opacity so that it is at 100%. Select your layer, create a mask, ne a mask next to it, and then you're going to zoom in, in, and with a fairly large brush, so make sure that you are on your selection tool, you're going to select your brush, and make it a nice soft brush. So I'm just going to quickly grab a nice soft brush here. Soft round. There we go. And painting black ink. Because black ink is going to reveal the layer below. We're then going to paint through into our image to get rid of those edges. That looks nice. 
and that's okay there. If you need to come back again, paint with some white ink to bring back into your image. And that's it. I think I need to just bring that in a little bit there. And you can also use a smaller brush if you need to come in for details. So now we have essentially a nice seamless view of our two files, left and middle image. We're then going to add the right hand image in exactly the same way. So I will switch on my right hand layer. We're going to move in. We're going to shift it around until it matches more or less correctly. And even there, just like that. Let's just come in a little bit tighter. Right. Oh, sorry, before I forget, what we really should have done is used our right, changed the opacity of the layer itself, and then you can line them up. So I'm looking at this area in particular where those two dunes line up. Okay, that's nice. And you can see there is a little bit of change over here, and I think that change means that we need to rotate the image. I'm going to hit Command T to transform my file. I'm then going to rotate the image ever so slightly. And we're just going to try and line that up a little bit. And we can move it down at the same time so that we're rotating accurately. And just pull this down. And you'll see suddenly all my lines start to add together very smoothly. That's looking much nicer. So a little bit of a movement there. There we go. And great. That looks good. Press Enter. And we're going to hit Command T again. I could have actually just gone straight through and just right clicked and then said Warp. And we're now just going to warp this into place so that the lines match up almost exactly. And you'll see the lines look pretty good. Okay, that's nice. My C has got some issues there, but we're going to fix that by the, with the paintbrush. Once I press enter, I'm then going to go back to my right side and change the opacity to 100%. You'll see there is some issues along the water, but that's not a problem. Because once more, I'm going to hit my create mask. And with black ink, so make sure it's black ink, we're going to use that brush and we're going to paint through and make sure that everything matches up nicely over here. We're just painting into the scene itself. And we can do this over here. Remember that your very large brush is going to have something of a feathered edge to it. So every now and again you do actually need to make your brush a little bit smaller just so that you don't end up with any feathering sort of obstruction inside the image that kind of, well not obstruction, but something inside the image which is going to end up looking slightly um, out, uh, just out of focus, not have detail inside it. So we want to maintain that detail. So we're going to just clean that up over there, make sure that our Files all match up nicely. There we go. The last view of it, like so. And there we go. There is our stitch that we have created manually from the images themselves. I'm now going to crop that image correctly. So we will just clear that over here and we'll bring in our crop so that we have the correct sized image here. There we go. And there we go. And we're going to hit enter. Yes, that looks good. All right. So now we have our base image. And if you would like to, you can remove your, uh, the, your bottom layer, which was just essentially the canvas size. And of course, we can flatten the whole image because we now have a complete photograph. So I will go to my contextual menu for the layers and I will right click and I will say flatten image. And there you go. You now have your raw file image, which is as if we take a look at it, it is 16,000 pixels on the long side by 5,000 and odd pixels on the height. So you've managed to get your panoramic image back and you've done it manually. Some images are obviously going to be more complex. So this image was fairly easy because the lines were very simple. But the important takeaway from this entire exercise is of course that the file itself is not a throwaway if the automated software isn't going to automatically stitch it into a panorama. You can still go into Photoshop or Affinity or any of the other bitmap editors that allow for um, pixel editing and you can correct your image or you can stitch them manually together to create your panoramic image. I'm now going to save this file and I will go back into Capture One to finish editing it and this is what it is going to look like at the end. 
I hope that was useful. Thanks very much again for watching. Remember to pop a like and a subscribe if you found it useful. I've got some more coming up. I've got some really interesting videos coming ahead, including a look at the Nisi Athena lenses, how to shoot rolling stock. I've been asked to do something on the Wacom tablet, which I will be doing soon as well. So there's lots to come. So please remember to subscribe. Thanks again for watching. Hope to catch you on the next one soon. Cheers.